gather, uh, and I'd like to ask you, uh, Muhammad, that uh, that kind of evasion of uh, the obvious facts of injustice subsequently was a couple of things. One, that the guy on the other side of the table was not a gentleman. And second, that he didn't regard us as any man at all. So now clearly we have to be about the business of finding more effective methods to raise the questions and to get the questions properly answered. What would you do, in, Muhammad, in terms of, in terms of for the benefit of, of white churches, kind of thing that you've been doing all along, daily, almost uh, how would you state the case for for reparations and you know I, there were there are a couple of things and a couple of ways to look at the whole question of reparations one is clearly in terms of the politics and the economics of, of the thing where we can look at the whole development of the great capital corporate capitalism in America the whole industrial revolution the whole super technological society that we have now and see that the capital that was accumulated for that process, for that development, you know, largely came through slavery. That America would not be the wealthy country it is today if it were not for the resources <coughs> of black people, the, uh, the free labor of black people. And that since slavery, the process has continued and that second class citizenship, and job discrimination, that these are just manifestations of kind of an updated slavery, a new style of slavery to meet new economic and social conditions. And looking at that, we see a whole case for the sense of debt, the idea of debt. Moreover, we can look at you know, historical and political um, precedents. What happened in Germany and what happened uh, subsequent to the fall of Nazi Germany was that the case for reparations was made for the Jews on two bases. One being the economic base, that is, the fascist government had expropriated land holdings of individual Jews, property holdings of individual Jews, but that it was a collective act aimed at Jewish people as a whole. The moral part of the argument, although it was never stated in the legal case, the real moral force behind the argument for Jewish reparations was the fact that the Germans had indeed, you know, practice such, kind, such barbarity against the Jews, the six million in the ovens, you know, was a case that nobody could ignore. The parallels for black people are, of course, the stolen labor, the free labor, in fact, the stolen people, you know, literally, physically stolen from one place and transported to another. And, of course, the, the series of barbarities, you know, practiced against our people have meant for us that we have always lived in a fascist nation. I mean, we have not experienced just a five or six year period of fascism, but we have experienced uh, a history in this country that's been a history of 40 million people killed, 40 million black people killed before getting to America on the slave ships between 1810 and 1850. The countless lynchings, the, uh, the countless acts of, of wanton police brutality. What happened in North Philadelphia not long ago when a mentally retarded child was shot down by a policeman, a 15 year old kid that for us, these, this has been the course of events, and that you know, there are precedents and parallels to the argument. That's one whole thing. Without getting too tedious and, and, and uh, recognizing that most of us here have some experience in the church and can probably speak to this better than I, there is, for Christians especially, for people coming out of the Judeo-Christian experience, there is a theological basis which has to do with what we call the three R's of repentance, reparations or restitution and reconciliation. That what has happened has been that crimes have been committed, sins have been committed, there is a blood debt, you know, uh, and that as it says, making scriptural reference, you know, as it says in the Bible, if, you have, if you've sinned against somebody, if you have a debt, that it's not enough just to mild repentance, but that the tree is known by its fruits, and that in order to make the repentance real, that there has to be some concrete act of repayment 
of setting things straight. And that this is, uh, you know, an, an action that must be, you know, a prelude to a full and complete reconciliation man to man and brother to brother and brothers together to God. So uh, for people coming from a theological basis, there's more than enough in the scripture to explain and justify and uh, pres prescribe the justice of the whole business of reparations. But you know, I think I have found that too often people would like to jump to the, the resurrection and the victory without going through the struggle. By that I mean in a meeting of our council of the diocese a few months ago, one of my fellow priests uh, seemed disturbed by some of my expressions and my feelings and tried to assure me that he was my brother. And then he asked me, uh, aren't we brothers? And I'm sure it was a painful thing for him to hear me say, no, we are not. And I feel that if he really wants to enter into a relationship of brotherhood, he must first recognize the injustice and the damage which has been done to me and that there must be an acknowledgement of this and there must be done something must be done to repair that damage which has been done before we can arrive at a relationship which, which is really called brotherhood yeah i think this is tremendously important because i think the history of the church in america has been one where there is in a sense been cheap grace you know we have always been concerned about confessing our sins but we've never really pushed this whole business of, of doing something physical to repair, to repay or make restitution for what we've done wrong. You know, there are very few church services today, for example, that don't include a period where you confess your weaknesses and your faults and your, the injustices that you have committed. But yet very few services really emphasize this need to make outward signs of your concern and your repentance. You know, we had in an earlier discussion, it talked about the, the fact that in the gathering together for the Lord's Supper, you know, we're always inviting people to the table, those who truly repent and are sorry for their sins and all of that. But even at that rate, you know, to come to the table isn't enough because we haven't encouraged the going out first to make straight what we've done wrong and then return to the table with having repaired some of this physical damage so that we haven't really made the physical signs of the inward change and we have never really encouraged this. I'm just wondering, Carol, brother, and you know, it just seems, that seems to be so very obvious, so very clear, that it's very difficult for me to, to, to believe that they're really churchmen, black or white for that matter, who would who would even make an attempt to refute that. I, and, and hence, it's very difficult for me to believe that there are churchmen who sincerely refute the demand for reparations on any grounds other than the grounds of their own bias and their own prejudice. I, I, you know, perhaps politically they may say that, that there's no, no ground for the, the demand for reparations, but Theologically, out of the framework of their own faith, it's just very difficult for me to understand why the Episcopalians had as much difficulty <coughs> in South Bend as they had. Why the Presbyterian Church or the Methodist Church, for that matter, would go through any great pains about it, about the acceptance of the guilt. Vaughn, I, I, I think that a part of the problem is, again, this matter of making certain assumptions which have not been true. This has been called a democracy, it has been called a land of opportunity, it has been said that anybody who's got any gumption about him can make it in this great American form of life. And therefore, the assumption is that if, if I have not made it, it's because I am lazy, I am inferior, or there's something wrong with me, but it's right there for you. And these persons would refuse to acknowledge that there has been oppression, that there has been a denial of, of opportunities, that there has, there has been a suppression of the rights of not only the black group as one of the American minorities, but all minority groups. And I think that this is where the hang-up is, the refusal to accept the fact that this has been an oppressive kind of a situation. And if people can once say that we have oppressed, we have denied, 
but even beyond that we have destroyed. Because, you know, as I think today of the whole thing about violence on the streets, people do not connect this violence with the other forms of violence and the violations of the dignity of man, the violation of our human <coughs> rights, the violation of all of the other rights. And therefore, the violence on the streets is but an outward and visible expression of the other subtle forms of violence, and they're really not so subtle, but the other forms of violence which, have, which are not being talked about. And once people are willing to acknowledge this, then perhaps they can say, well, uh, it seems as though this is a real case for reparations. We have indeed uh, damaged and repair must be made. You mean to suggest then, you know, I, I believe that when Jim Foreman went to, uh, spoke on a Sunday morning at St. George's Episcopal Church in, in, in New York City, I think, uh, when a question and, question and answer period at the end, or after the morning <coughs> service, uh, the rector of that church made the observation that, uh, that if his people were told that that their church was operating on funds that came from prostitution and gambling and mm -hmm. a lot of uh, illicit kinds of uh, relationships having to do with sex and the obvious, or that had out of the puritanical tradition or the obvious sins, that they would uh, be repulsed, that they would be sick unto death even. But that if they were told, as they were that morning, that their funds, their operating money was coming from the, from the, uh, from the banks that invest in the apartheid system of South Africa, and that their funds are derived from the, the cheated banana republics of Latin America and from the, the, the backs of black folk in this country who are exploited, and nobody even so much as raises an eyebrow. And this is the violence that I'm talking about. That's the about. kind of violence right. that you're referring to. And I, you know, I, I'm just wondering, you know, the, uh, the, you know if, you, if you gentlemen find that to be the case, you know, and, and the reason for it, because it's just difficult for me, in spite of what Paul has said, you know, <coughs> That, uh, that people will refuse to recognize their participation and complicity in the racist structure. But, uh, you know, f for what reasons do they refuse to recognize it? I mean, they certainly can't be sound reasons in terms of their own theology and their own, their own faith. I, I can, you know, I could very well accept that if you, we got A. James in our churches, that's, you know, commonly referred to the person who sits back in the pew. Well, certainly in white churches, there, there's somebody comparable to that. You know, that old sister who's been there for years sitting on that one pew, and perhaps she doesn't understand because she's waiting for the prophet to give her direction. But why is it that the prophet can't accept it? Why is it that the prophet is unable to see or refuses to see? The thing that, that I think uh, either puts people off or uh, is a convenient excuse is uh, the mode, let's say, in which uh, uh, the Manifesto and Foreman and uh, Muhammad and others uh, make the confrontation. That is, um, to me, uh, in terms of my own faith, in terms of uh, my, my confidence in the Bible, um, the biblical picture of people like Amos uh, coming into Bethel, into the church, into the cathedral of that little uh, town and, and pronouncing God's judgment on them for the hypocrisy of all their religious assemblies with injustice at their door uh, and how Amaziah, the, uh, the head priest, uh, didn't like it a bit and told Amos to get out of there. Uh, how, uh, how Jesus uh, finally, uh, after a lot of conversation with the Pharisees and others of the religious establishment of that time, finally felt that it, it just wasn't getting through and he went into the cathedral nation. I can't help but think you know, of a guy like Foreman coming into Riverside or any of you going into any church, just exactly as far as I can see what Jesus did. And, of course, he got crucified for it. That is, people don't like to have judgment pronounced on them. And to me, uh, one of the soundest, in, in, my, in terms of my own theological faith, one of the soundest aspects of the whole manifesto, regardless of its rhetoric, is the fact that, to me, there's a very modern parallel of, of a prophetic judgment. Now, the mode of it, today, as with Amos and with Jesus, offends and irritates and makes the people, of course, who are being judged furious. 
uh, because of the exposure and because they're, uh, they can't hide anymore. They're out there. And here is this thing that, uh, that uh, begins to unfold, all the exploitation and the injustice. So uh, I think people react in fury uh, at the mode of the confrontation uh, and really then don't deal in their own minds with the justice of it. Is it a conscious decision to react to the mode, or, or is that simply an excuse not to deal with the issue itself? Is, that, is, that, is it that the mode sort of sidetracks one's thinking momentarily so that they are un unconsciously, they react to, to the, the blatant interruption of services? Or do they react to it <coughs> consciously knowing that the reason why they're reacting to that is because they don't want to deal with the issue? I, I think I, I believe that the people in that circumstance largely react un, unconsciously. In other words, I believe that uh, it takes quite a bit of uh, soul searching uh, and a deep, uh, deep review of your, of your beliefs and what you see in front of you uh, before you're going to be willing to uh, even begin to accept any guilt. Particularly, I think it's true uh, when you get to someone who may have thought that that uh, that he was your brother, Paul, and is suddenly surprised to find out that you don't think he is, and can't quite understand what he did. He himself as an individual. This distinction between an individual and in a society, I think, is is uh, is part of the hang-up, and it isn't. I don't believe in most cases a conscious uh, effort to uh, first accept the guilt and then say. No, uh, uh, I better uh, say that they used the wrong methods. I think they, 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 you develop ways of dealing in, the, in society. One of them is, uh, is uh, the methods you're going to use, and one is the right, if you will, way to go about things. And uh, I don't think that, uh, that they've accepted, the consciously accepted the guilt. That's where the problem is. Well, doesn't this say something then about our whole <laughs> church tradition and experience that we have over the whole history of this country and well as they certainly have to rely on their heritage but doesn't this begin to kind of point out how we've we've allowed people to grow to most of these folks have spent their whole life in the church and we have allowed them to grow old never having to face themselves or what the Christian experience is all about and Carl, they don't understand what the Christian witness is. And, and in connection with that, this is why people. I feel that there is a, a real mission which falls upon us. I do not see that we can any longer allow people to live these lies. And, you know, I'm not going to accuse them of anything because people choose to accept an easy way out. Or, you know, people do that. But for us to continue to cooperate with this kind of a life, means that it comes to that point where we must assume responsibility for the condition itself. Mm -hmm. I can no longer, myself, uh, be willing to go along with it and not call attention to the fallacies, not call attention to the lies, and expose it. And then, once it is exposed, we have to try to deal with it. But I think that it has to be done. The thing uh, I think that is, you know, a really a crucial thing to that mm -hmm. is, uh, and a thing that I think has gone largely unrecognized, is that the manifesto movement and the reparations movement says not only to the white community, but says to the black community, you have been a participant in a sin, you know, to permit one's humanity to be denied without protesting, you know, without being about the business of trying to reclaim one's, one's humanity, one's manhood is sinful. I mean, again, the scripture says, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And we, if, if we as blacks are not about the business of actively, actively loving ourselves and loving our own, then clearly we're lying when we profess to love white. So I think that, you know, there's a whole re redemptive thing in the manifesto in terms of black people too. But I think the failure, well, I, just as a question I'd have to ask, if the failure of, uh, of whites to recognize that aspect of the struggle, if, if, if the posture of being, you know, um, we who are accused rather than we who are with potential brothers presented with an opportunity, you know, to work our way, uh, work our way to, some, to some just situation together. If that posture is not indeed indicative of, of the racism in the church, that church leaders have, you know, allowed to, to remain there. I think one of the problems is, and it comes at this point, Mohammed, is that a great many of the people in the church 
uh, were put off precisely because the judgment was directed against the church, their image of themselves, uh, the, the liberal leadership of the church, their image of themselves has been that of standing with their black brothers in opposition to this corrupt and racist system out here. Uh, for years, the churches have officially been on record and working with little programs here and there, uh, you know, a non-segregated church in a non-segregated society, uh, identifying the, the racist history of the nation and favoring compensatory action, which is another word for reparations, on behalf of the, of the nation, programs of, of government uh, service and uh, so on. But when when Mr. Foreman stands up and says, thou art the man, mm -hmm. when he lays the responsibility for the situation and the guilt at the door of the institution that has an image of itself as being in the forefront of the fight to eradicate racism and its uh, manifestations from society, then that really shook a lot of people. They said, you know, us, uh, but we're on the right side. Uh, we're not racist. Look what we did. After the Civil War, we went down and established schools and freedmen's bureaus, and we've had this long history of service, medical, educational. We've uh, supported all these liberal programs and so on. And then to hear the word of judgment, and I think this is one of the healthiest things about the whole thing, is that the word of judgment has been spoken to the church in the church in the midst of this. But that comes as a not only as a profound uh, psychological shock to be told you are guilty, but also as a profound uh, logical shock because of the image that so many good liberal white churchmen have had that they and their institution were in the forefront of this battle. And so I think the fundamental struggle really is to establish this connection between the church as an institution and the racist system in which it has uh, grown up. Many people simply refuse to understand that behind the official declarations and protestations of the church has been this long history of, of benefit, association with, and you could even use some stronger terms of relationship between that church and the system uh, which it has implicitly blessed and which has made it uh, a strong and uh, vital part of this uh, flawed American dream that Paul has talked about. And so I think the issue really does come back. Uh, many people in the church are quite willing to face the justice of reparations so long as it's understood to refer to the racist society and its mistreatment in the past. But when it comes to the church, uh, they say, you know, no, we're on the other side, and they can't handle that. Well, you know, Dean, I think that it's something must <clears throat> again confront the church, and that is that the church has done much of its good, quote unquote, as charity, acts of charity. And as far as we are concerned, uh, this is not charity. We're not concerned about charity. Uh, we are concerned about the fact that we have been damaged and we want repair for the damage which has been done. And I know that, that uh, this takes it into another ball field altogether. But, yeah, uh, I think that's I, sure yeah, yeah, ahead, I, I was just going to say that in regard to that, one of the, the priests in the Episcopal Diocese refers to some of the things that are going on to help black people and other people as Band-Aid societies and Band-Aid groups. And uh, I, I agree with what uh, Dean said and uh, feel that it also is involved in the church uh, trying to, uh, over the years, be sure that it was separate from the state. You know, it's, it's, the church is really set up, uh, is, is sort of the way this goes, the church is really set up to take care of its own parish and to see that the people in that parish uh, go to heaven and live good lives, or in the, in the reverse order. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, that's what it is. And it's not really supposed to get involved in the social and economic problems of this country. Now, what the manifesto did, it not only said you're guilty, and hoisted us right up on our Christian swords because uh, once we get through yelling about how it's Marxist and the, you know, the, the preamble of the manifesto is Marxist and anti-Christian and anti this and anti that, we get down to the little, uh, not the little seed, but the seeds of truth in the manifesto, we say, yeah, that's right. And, uh, but what does it mean? In order to take any action, we've got to get involved in the world. Yeah. And the church doesn't like that, uh, really. They, they say they are involved in the world, but they aren't really. I just, it, I think, I, 
I just wonder how it is that, or how is it, you know, that there's so much difficulty with the church accepting the principle of reparations and beginning to act upon it, when nobody, in fact, has has of any that is of any note. And I haven't, and since the press has been pretty careful to 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 blow up any kind of opposition, nobody's been taking issue with the legitimacy with the legitimacy of the demand itself. That that you know that that this that this trinity that exists in the country between church, business, and government is not really taken issue with. Nobody, no one bothers to take issue with that. Hence, it would seem that the demand then is recognized as legitimate, that in conjunction with what Paul has just said, what the opposition is about is the, that we want to determine what we're going to do. Now, you know, nobody's going to knock church charity but that is implicit in the definition of church. But what we're talking about is repair for damages, which, you know, would, one would say in, in, in biblical terms, this you ought to do and not to leave the other undone. Surely you're supposed to give. You're not supposed to stop giving because you're going to pay for a sin. You pay for a sin and continue to give. But another thing that we're dealing with is a matter of self-determination. Hence you know, the, the benevolent churches who have come around to saying, yes, the demand for reparations is just, and we're going to act upon it, we're going to raise several hundred thousand dollars, but we're going to give it to our boys over here, and we're going to, you know, the hell with the, the Black Economic Development Conference and all those fellas. They made a demand, but we don't want to deal with them. We're going to appoint, appoint our black uh, uh, people within our own communion, and all we're going to pick one of these long-standing uh, civil rights groups and give it to them. They are trusted friends. We know that they're going to... Well, you see, black people are saying <clears throat> that you're going to do it the way we say do it. We're the ones that have been hurt. You know, when you're taking something out of my house, you don't give... You can give me any number of things, but I want that thing back that you took. And I think, that, you know, perhaps Muhammad could speak to that in, in, some, in some more concrete terms, in terms of in terms of this whole quest for self-determination and the recognition of this trinity that exists in this country. And it's not a new trinity, in fact. It has always existed between church, business, and government, where although the rhetoric would say that we are separated, there's a separation between church and state, that the, vo though the very persons who sit in the Congress and determine against, I believe, Thaddeus Stevens after the, second, after the Civil War, that we're not going to give the 40 acres and a mule work those who sat in the churches, sat on the boards, who sat on the trustee boards and the boards of managers and so forth, who, were the, who comprised the session and so forth. Those very ones who made those racist kinds of laws and enforced them were good old Presbyterians and Episcopalians and good old Methodists and so forth. And so that there is an explicit relationship between the church, business, and government that I think has to be dealt with. Ma, before you uh, speak, there's just one thing that I want to point out, and that is that in good, you know, Christian theology, uh, it is not the offender which determines uh, how the repentance will be acted out. God the offended, you have sinned against me, and I set forth the terms. Uh, for your repentance and for atonement. And what black people are saying today is that we're not going to let white people tell us what they are going to do, but we are the offended and we will set forth the terms or the conditions. Go ahead, Mo. Yeah, I mean, it's what, you know, what you're just saying is, I think, just so, so very, very crucially important because the experience of black people has been such to indicate very, very clearly that you can't let this man go and solve the problem himself. You know, um, what has happened has been that, well, just politically what has happened is, has been that those movements in the country throughout history led by whites that said they would address themselves to the problems of blacks have ended up leaving blacks stranded high and dry. That happened with the po populist movement. That happened with some of our brothers and sisters who got caught up in the communist movement in the 30s, you know, and, and found out that these people were white first and left second. A similar kind of thing, uh, I think it's, it's the same kind of thing that's, uh, 
gotten at theologically by the question of who decides how the offense is to be paid. I mean, accepting the, the fact of guilt, accepting the fact of participation in racism would clearly indicate that he who is most infected by racism is he who is least qualified to decide, you know, what is the cure. Now, I think that part of the problem, though, for just the run of the mill, the, lay, the layman, the lay Christian, or uh, just the guy who, you know, who goes to the synagogue and doesn't, uh, isn't involved in, in setting the, the policies, you know, setting the, the guidelines, that one of the things that has, been ha that has happened is that he has been sold short by his clergy, by his leaders. People in the church, you know, are well aware, the leadership of the church is aware of where church monies are. But what happens? You have a case with the Methodist, for instance, where there are, our research shows, uh, direct investment in Nepal. But people in the church aren't told this. They are told that the Methodists don't have any money in tobacco, which again is true, but you know, a little irrelevant at this stage of the game that um, those, those liberals who you say feel you know, particularly offended and particularly caught up tight because black people are saying to them, hey, you, you are the one, you are the man. Well, these are the guys who, who sit on top of the church structures. They're the guys who know what's been happening in fact. They know better than the lay Christian where the monies are invested. They know better than the lay Christian what the uh, real priorities are, you know. So I think that not only are we talking about taking into account the institutions and the way that the institutions have functioned historically and function now, but that we have to particularly look at the responsibility upon the leaders of the church, especially the clergy, but you know, white lay leaders too, who knew what was going down. How come you cats, you know, let this thing go down like that? And I think that the reason for it, the reason for it gets back, gets back even to the point that was raised earlier about the opposition to the method. You know, it's not what you say, but the way you have said it. And there are a number of things that we have to be conscious of. Black people in and out of the church are conscious of the fact that, number one, the manifesto movement never would have attracted the attention that it did if its language had been less direct. That's the first thing. And the second, the business, uh, everybody was crazy about Abraham Lincoln because on his way to, to court one day, he stopped by the roadside and pig, pulled a pig out of the mud and got himself all muddy. And everybody said, this is really great, the way he you know, inconvenienced, inconvenienced himself to, uh, to help this pig. Yet, white Christians permit themselves to equate the uh, disruption of a Sunday morning service, to equate uh, having a two-hour dialogue session with what? with 400 years of suffering on the part of black people, with the fact that, you know, millions of people, black, white, brown, in this country go to bed hungry, with the fact that, you know, the priorities of the nation are such that it's easier to get money to kill and, and be killed in Vietnam than it is to run a Head Start program. You know, and um, I think that it, g it gets back to racism and particularly to the kind of irresponsible racism that's been practiced by the liberal leaders of the church. Mohammed, I, I think it is, it's, as you say, it's, it's horrible and uh, really a terrible indictment, I think, of the, of the Christian church that, um, that, as you say, we should be so upset by a little disorder in a church on a Sunday morning, uh, but keep on uh, smiling and saying things are great and everything's okay while uh, our bombers uh, drop napalm on, on Vietnamese people. That is, the, the blood and the carnage there and uh, the injustice in our cities uh, for Christians on a Sunday morning to be more concerned about taste than truth uh, is, is an awful reflection. I, I think uh, that uh, I was reminded earlier, Dean, when you were talking about the white liberal of uh, Dick Gregory's comment uh, one time, I, he said, a, a, a liberal is a cat who will lynch you from a low branch. Um, I indicating, uh, you see, the thing that the Foreman Manifesto has done has, has, has unveiled the white liberal to himself. And I speak partly uh, uh, confessionally here because this has been something of my own experience. That is, people who, uh, who let's say, have fought for civil rights in voting and uh, worked with people like Martin Luther King and, and, in other words, done what they thought they should do. Now, to have to face the fact that all the time when we were talking about integration, we really meant uh, black integration into white society where I still run things. Uh, and, and the offense of the manifesto, part of it is, you know, no, we want to run 
things or some things. And uh, I think then the white liberal who feels he's, he's been doing something, uh, as he says, for the blacks, you know, all these years, uh, has to then discover that uh, he's been paternalistic all along without realizing it. Uh, and that maybe, uh, uh, maybe he still wants to control what's done uh, for blacks and whites. I think it's very hard for the white liberal to, to face it that, as you were saying, Paul, he's willing to share a little charity, some crumbs, but not power. I think that, you know, when uh, we've got to, you know, there's some very concrete and specific things that have, uh, have been demanded. And that is certainly recognition of the Black Economic Development Conference and payment of reparations to it. Now, that doesn't mean simply to it. That doesn't mean that you stop giving your contributions to other groups, as we said earlier. But there are some other folks, you know, who, have, who, have, who are about the business of having to deal with this because of some direct confrontation or simply because they happen to be involved in this thing in some one way or the other. And, and I don't know, but I think it seems that, that, that the case is rather clear for, for most of us, somehow or another. I don't know if we have some real serious questions about it. And it might be a real good time for, for perhaps, you know, we don't want to make this a dramatic kind of thing, you know, where, you know, you have black people just getting hot and, mo and splitting. But, but maybe we ought to just get off a bit and let, let some of the other folks who are here come in and, 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 and the group of you right. can wrestle with this question, you know, with the time remaining. And, and, and then maybe we'll come back and deal with it together. How's that? Let's go. Let's, go, let's, let's try that. Let's All right. It. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Cliff, while we're, we're making some shifts here, um, uh, you're associated with the Friends Meeting in Chester, uh, where uh, there has been, uh, uh, as I understand it, a black group who has uh, uh, the building that you have has been turned over to them to, uh, to uh, put on a program. Uh, can you tell us about that and your own feelings about it, what's happening? Well, I think in the first place I, uh, I ought to point out that I am a member of, the, of that meeting, but I'm here as an individual, so I'd like to uh, make that clear, and my views are my own. And in some cases, I may, uh, I certainly can relate the, the facts, which I could, uh, would try to do. Uh, in fact, uh, this group which uh, approached, uh, uh, which uh, took over, if you will, the, uh, the building which w had housed uh, agencies uh, uh, working in the neighborhood, uh, is not exactly a, uh, a direct part or claims not to be a direct uh, part of the uh, BEDC, although, of course, Muhammad was one of the, uh, uh, those who uh, uh, was in the initial uh, uh, confrontations and uh, uh, right through the whole thing. The, uh, basically, the, uh, the group uh, came and said, uh, you wanted an all-black board, which was true of, of one of these, uh, one of the two agencies. Uh, here we are. And uh, we'll take uh, we'll take over now, thank you, and just turn over and resign. And uh, to the meeting, which uh, at this point in time owns the building, but does not uh, and has membership on these boards, but is not they are not a direct part of the meeting. See, they historically they're founded by by the meeting and then uh, got on their own feet, and became separate entities. Uh, to the meeting, uh, this group said. Also, we'd like to have the deed to the building, and also we'd like to have rather substantial funds to operate for the next couple of years. Uh, the meeting has, has been handling this uh, uh, really as a separate local incident, and I'd have to say that I don't believe that the meeting really feels uh, that it has come to grips with, the, with reparations per se, but has uh, looked at a specific individual incident which had its own uh, long history and development uh, to that point in time and decided uh, with, with a lot of soul searching this summer and the meeting has really had a lot to uh, a lot to go through in, the, in that three organizations were uh, involved. Many people who, Dean, as you say, have been uh, 
long time and Don, a long time liberal working people have been doing things here in or helping to do things which they felt were the way to improve uh, uh, the lot of uh, their brothers to find that uh, some of their brothers were saying no uh, that isn't the way and uh, we don't agree with you and furthermore we're not going to have it anymore and you're going to just step aside met with naturally a a good deal of uh, resistance and reluctance, and I would say that uh, uh, the meeting at this point has uh, has allowed the use of the building to this group and wishes them uh, uh, success, uh, hopes that others will uh, uh, find their way uh, clear to uh, assist them uh, in the programs which they want to put on, which uh, incidentally aren't very much different than the programs uh, that were being carried on, uh, but under their own direction. You know, Cliff, you, you've had to deal with, with something directly that uh, I've often wondered how, um, how I would deal with if I were involved in it, and that is the, uh, the uh, direct sort of give me something material. You know, not, not going through the normal, let me call it white man's procedures that we have for turning property over. I remember I was at a meeting once with, uh, at which Mohammed Kenyatta was present, as a matter of fact, and Matty Humphreys here in Philadelphia, uh, a, a, a black militant, uh, said uh, at that time to, uh, to us, you've got a commercial Jesus and a religious Santa Claus. And in the context in which she was using it, she was referring to, the, to our dollars and our material wealth, that our Jesus is a dollar and that our, that our God is really a kind of a Santa Claus that gives us what we want if we're very nice to him. And uh, uh, I, I think that that's part of the, uh, the hang-up on reparations and the Black Manifesto, is they're really, uh, uh, blacks are really saying, you know, give us this, you owe it to us, and we say, yeah, 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 that's right, we do, but that's money you're asking for. <laughs> and you know, it, it, it's, it, the truth of Matty Humphrey's statement just really got me right uh, in the very heart of me. I, I don't know what I'd do if someone came in and said, uh, we like your uh, parish and uh, uh, you owe us reparations, so we're going to take it over. That's a little different than what you're doing, but you know. Uh, I think this is a good point to, to give, mm -hmm. uh, ask, give Frank a chance to, uh, to talk because that's just exactly what happened to him this summer when the Cookman Church was occupied. Frank, what, what's your response and thinking about all this? Well, I think the uh, first response is I think we have to look very carefully at the 12 people who are here and see who is not here. I think that's very significant. Because what has happened here is we have set up a group of black persons who, as near as I can see, and every indication I have represent a small minority of the black community. And you've set up a group of other persons who by and large, as far as I know, do not live under the very circumstances that we're concerned about here. Now, I think that's a setup. So I'm not sure there could be any real meaningful discussion here. So I'm going to be a loner at the very outset. This summer, a group, and I'm not really sure who the group is because it changed, but a group of persons, at least the beginning of them, out of another church in the neighborhood of Cookman, came into Cookman without prior notice. Although, as a matter of fact, four months before this, one member who did come in had been invited to put on paper and said he would a proposal that I had promised to back for how they could operate in the church. In any case, they came in. Now, slogans go fast and loose. And I think most of the people involved uh, in a situation like this um, really are not in a position to know very much about it. So I felt the best thing to do would be to see who was inside and who was outside. And what did they feel? I had responsibility for the program in this church, not because I solicited it, not because I held on to it, 
but because we acquired it by default. Other groups wouldn't accept the responsibility. So I waited. Well, the first thing that happened, we got over 100 letters in the first two days, all from people who said they were black, all saying, we support you in your position. Then I got telegrams from black clergymen of the churches surrounding Cookman, saying they thought it was a shame and disgrace what this group had done, and do not give in. Then I got one of the man who again uh, says he's black, uh, who's uh, very well known in the city, who came to me and said, Frank, don't give them a thing. Then I got a call from uh, some people from the Archdiocese office. On a personal basis, just said, we're praying for you, is there anything we can do to help? Then I asked about the Council of Black Clergy. Now, now who's included in this? And they said, well, all the black churchmen except a few. And I said, which denominations aren't represented? Well, the Baptists, of course the Roman Catholics, the holiness group by and large. Uh, and they went down the list. Well, then when I began to look these up in the calendar, this represents three quarters of the black churches. So I began to wonder. Then I looked at my own conference minutes. Now I'm sure you're getting squirming right now. I looked at my own conference minutes and I saw the, the black ministers in our own conference who were very strongly in support of what we were doing and the ones who were critical of it. And in the most recent conference minutes, without exception, the ones whose churches were thriving were for us and the ones who had declining memberships were questioning. We also found that black people who lived in Chestnut Hill were very critical of us. But black clergymen who had been struggling over the years with the problems on Lehigh Avenue called me up at 8 o'clock in the morning, came over to the house to pray with me at night. Now, maybe the whole, maybe 90% of the black community is wrong. Maybe these gentlemen who were here are right. But certainly no white man should come and say, he is any person to judge what black people want. So what I tried to do is simply what the majority of black people told me that they wanted. Now, they have shown that since. For example, 30, 30 people who live next to Cookman took it completely on their own because I certainly didn't want to put them in a difficult spot. Took it on their own to get together and give us a petition saying that they wanted us to understand that this group that was inside in no way represented what they wanted. Later on, I had a meeting, and I found out that in one of our city departments, they had been threatened over the phone. Now, maybe this is not true, but this is what I was told in the presence of a commissioner and the person who was putting his job in jeopardy to say this, that the Black Panthers called him and threatened him that if they did not come up and repudiate Cookman, that there'd be all kinds of trouble. I know that there were threats made to our bishop about what would happen if he didn't go along with them. Now, under those circumstances, uh, I do believe in a democracy. I've lived 15 years in North Philadelphia. I believe in reparations. I believe very deeply in it. I think reparations means to be concerned enough to go as a servant. And that's what I've tried to do. But I've had to listen to somebody. I've had to ask people what they wanted. What do they want me to do? Where do they want me to serve? And I've had to have an ear for it. That's why I've lived in North Central Philadelphia for 15 years, so I could understand what my neighbors want. Because I am concerned about this, because I did grow up in a relatively affluent place. This is why my children go to public school at Ferguson School, one of the lowest ranking in the city. 
because I want my neighbors to know I do care about what happens to my daughter, so I care about theirs. That's why we have so many school children in our, in our school, in the church afterward. Frank, so I think, I'm saying, I yeah. think, and that the <clears throat> irony of this thing, and I'm not going to let go either, the irony of this thing is that people who made the pronouncements, virtually no one, asked Cookman first, what is your program? No one tried to check. Excuse me for interrupting you, Ms. Council. I've been letting you go on, uh, giving your points as if there was no question about them. Sure. And obviously there's two sides. And, Fine. Uh, and since I was one of the people involved with Cookman, I happen to know about another side. For instance, it's interesting how you forgot to mention a petition that had 3,000 names on it taken in the community where Cookman is. Did anyone see it? Yeah, I saw it, and, uh, and, and it was directed to, 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 your, uh, to your offices. But I don't think that's the point of the discussions after this morning. This morning. Uh, uh, could, why, why wasn't this ever brought to us? We asked for it. Uh, the person who was responsible for doing it, I'm sure, did or tried. Uh, probably what happened, which was happening all the while, when we tried to talk to your offices, we couldn't get an answer. That's probably what Mr. happened. Mr. Haynes was in the house the entire time. We had uh, staff there 24 hours a day for the entire uh, time. And your group was in. Bob, you were in and made a long-distance phone call on his uh, phone, didn't you? Sure. Did you have any problem getting in? No. Did you use the phone in the office? Uh, the point is, you probably had trouble reaching Mr. Hipple. Or perhaps uh, Frank, I don't know. And the bishop. And the bit. Well, of course, unfortunately, oh. I, very unfortunately, the bishop was out of town. Right. But, you know, what I'm trying to say is, I don't think that this is the. I don't think we're here to debate the issues at Cookman because if we were, we would have the people who knew about it at hand. Uh, I think that, that, that. I'm here. Yeah, right. Well, you know, but uh, as I said, I don't think we're here to debate that. Uh, that's exactly the point, and that's what you, concerns me. May I ask if, you if you're right in general, but not in particular, what about it? Uh, I was going to ask you a question. Now, sure. If you want me to stop so you can ask me a question, I'll be glad to. But Fine. I was in the process of Go asking ahead. you one. The uh, question I'd like to ask you is, well, there's one little curious question. I didn't know what you meant when you said the person who came to you who professes to be black. What, what, did, what did you mean by that? Well, <laughs> I, uh, I would say that certainly I don't know what, you know, this word black means. Uh, when I've said to someone uh, that this is a person who is black, who said this, uh, someone says to me, well, but they weren't black. And all I'm trying to say is that since I didn't see them face to face, uh, if someone writes to me and says... I thought you said he came to you. I'm talking about a person you mentioned. So you said a person came to you and, said he, and, and, and he said he was black or he professed to be black, the implication was that he might not have been. Well, I was wondering as a matter of fact, I'm talking about a particular person who, uh, who makes a great many statements in the press, and very often people have said, oh, well, he's not black. Let me uh, say something, Jim, if you don't mind. First of all, you know, as, as Jim has pointed out, we didn't come here to talk about that Cookman situation, but evidently that's all that's on your mind, Mr. No. Kensel. This was the question Let asked me. Let me go on. You're interrupting me. Mm -hmm. you, were, you went on for about five or ten minutes. The thing that bothers me, and it isn't, my question isn't going to be addressed to you particularly, because sure. I would definitely not want to do that, because mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to deal with it, evidently. But the thing that bothers me is, out of our previous discussion, we sat in here, the group of us, and we talked about the demand for reparations. We talked about its legitimacy. And this man, you have sat there and said you believe in reparations, because what you believe in it may have to be questionable. But this is the problem. Here is a man who would sit up, and I trust that you will understand me, because I say this with all Christian humility, whatever that means that you have sat there with so many lies, to put it very frankly and candidly about that Cookman situation, that when we talk to gentlemen who are going to be willing to deal with the question of reparations, how do you begin to deal with this kind of situation? That's the question I want to, you know, how do you begin to deal with that? Well, I think it also brings out the idea of the modality, you know, the way in which you do things, because if there were threats back and forth, that certainly changes the situation. It no longer is a, a discussion on the real deep religious part of it, but it becomes an actual confrontation, and people are afraid of one or another, and you have people calling on the phone. That changes the whole thing around. It makes it a very practical thing. You're right, Phil, and I would contend that where there are threats made, if they if yeah, that is the case, that I would want to document that. That's you right. see, it's always rumors. I, I would always want. You situation. see, when you throw in rumors and you're not able to document it, then I can consider them nothing but rumors. When, but, when but it is part of the way things get done, though. As soon as something happens in the public, it becomes a confrontation. 
all these things are side issues of it, and it becomes very difficult to, to handle it in a very calm, rational way. Yes, but churchmen, you, you know, churchmen the throw the fat in the fire. You know, that's where we yeah. have a problem. Yeah. I'm asking, you know, what, how do you deal with that so that churchmen don't start to camouflage the real issues with a bunch of erroneous kinds of statements? Yeah, well, Vaughn, I think it's, it's true that, you know, threats are probably made in these situations, and they do need to be documented when possible. But documented or not, in other words, if you can prove that it was or wasn't, really doesn't change the basic structure of the situation. In a kind of controversial and highly charged situation, you're going to have things like this. Uh, you can't lay any standard of perfection yeah. on uh, either the black militant groups who are attempting to bring these matters to the nation's attention or on churchmen or anybody else. Uh, in the midst of a highly emotional and charged situation, you're going to have that. The thing that disturbed me, I think, uh, more than anything else about this explanation of what happened at Cookman uh, was the uh, attempt to decide the situation on the basis of, of adding up signatures or uh, you know, groups of 30 or 60 or the people in the immediate neighborhood or, or so forth. I think one of the points that's made very clear in the introduction to the Black Manifesto is a recognition on the part of the people who prepared it that in the black community there are a great many people who do not understand the realities of the present situation in the same way they do. I can certainly say that in the white community and in the white church there are an awful lot of people who don't understand things the way I do in regard to the racial situation in our country historically in the present and in the hopes for the future. But you know I don't think we get anywhere as responsible churchmen trying to decide what's right and what's biblical and what the church really ought to be trying to do as it follows its Lord by, by going out and seeking to, to line up uh, groups of people on one side or the other. The, the questions having to do with reparations, it seems to me, are uh, that are incumbent upon us to try to answer some attempt to understand historically the roots of our present situation and the a relationship of church bodies to the present, and then to decide uh, in the light of the gospel what is required of us, not in the light of uh, how many of our members line up on one side or the other, or how many people in one neighborhood or another may line up on one side or the other. I think another thing, uh, uh, Dean, is that we should also be concerned with how uh, we are going to be uh, successful in doing what is required and doing what is right, and that means... Uh, being concerned also about where the people are. But what does success Their mean experience. in this context? Uh, the success in the Christian sense of convincing people but, and persuading people that something that ought to be done is done. But both of, but both of you, you know, are, are saying something that, that I'd like to question. Uh, you say, you find out, we have to, both of you are basically saying, I think, that you have to, we have to find out what's wrong, and then we do something about it. Well, who are these we's? You know, I think this is one of the problems. You know, uh, who is this deciding making we? If we're talking about, you know, the people who've always made the decisions now get some new information. Uh,